Hello, Laurel. Welcome back to the new mid. We are so excited you are here. Super excited. I uh, I was actually the one said version one was so much fun. Let's do version two. And if this is fun, we'll have version three. We'll be right <laughs> I love it. You are going to be a regular on the new mid. <laughs> love it. Well, when we were talking, you, what I love so much about you, Laurel, many things, but one of the many things I love is that you are, your mission is to empower women to take control of their, their money, to take control of their finances, especially now that we are in midlife. It's so important. So I would love to ask you, what is a healthy money mindset? Because so many of us fear money. Um, we're scared of money. And a lot of that comes from our upbringing. So what is a healthy mindset and how do we get there? Not just a little bit of a loaded question. <laughs> a loaded question. So you're going to go to the secret and you're going to watch my little, you know, chapter over and over, over and over and over and over and over and over. Um, and in fact, if you want me to autograph and send you, you know, the good old fashioned CD, I still have a whole bunch of those from the secret. And I'm in like the middle and it says money comes easily and frequently. Now, I talk about the fact that that's like, sounds like a lie because I grew up in a farm in Nebraska. So I didn't grow up with that. I grew up with work hard, work hard, work hard and don't ask for it. So I had a really screwed up, you know, mindset. But, you know, mindset also is an excuse. I think that a lot of people use it as a story to not get to it. Because as you know, Michelle, I'm the how-to girl. So here's how you just get to it. You let me teach you, show you how to make money really fast. So if you've been laid off, your husband controls the checkbook. Well, first of all, it's you that has to start the conversation. And how you start the conversation, especially if you're scared about it, is, and I'm going to give you a whole bunch of goodies and gifts. Uh, you're going to get this millionaire maker, and you're going to read it. What a novel concept. Um, and find it from the best you know about you and your family. Find the story that's most like what you did to yourself. So you read the first three chapters. That's your chapter three sequencing, and then you get to chapter four, which is direct, alloc uh, direct asset allocation. How do you do it? So then you start reading about seven families and how they change the family's life. <clears throat> so as a woman, you have to, have to, have to, have to get in the family conversation about money. And honestly, on the converse, if you're the one in charge, the man has to, because I can tell you having, um, I know we're going to, I know you want to talk about my near-death experience. Uh, 52 minutes to live on uh, January 3rd, 2021 at 1.36 in the morning. Um, but I can tell you, like, my son is totally equipped. He's 21 years old. You say, oh, my God, how can he be equipped? Because I raised him that way. All right. My husband, not so much because our assets aren't commingled. My son will actually be, my son and my daughter will be the ones receiving uh, an amass estate from me. I want a generational wealth. I, it's not going to happen to me. I, God knows what I'm going to get. I'm going to get a little surprise basket. You know, and it's going to be read by my mom's lawyer when she passes, and God knows what it's going to look like or breathe like. Is which I think is such bullshit around money. <clears throat> you should be talking about it, living out loud about it, and understanding it. So, women, a man cannot be your plan. You need to understand money. So, read my book, and then to start the conversation. If you're scared of it, I would say get my game, get Monopoly, start, and then you know if he gets involved, say we need to start a money conversation in our family. That's how easy, that's the script. We need to start a money conversation in our family. We all need to know about it. <clears throat> You're dealing with it every day of your life from paying a mortgage to paying rent, to paying your car, to paying for this little device, to paying you know, for this device we're watching through your computer. You're in money conversations. You take your kids you know, out to eat. You take yourself to Starbucks or whatever coffee place. You're always transacting, so stop being unconscious. So I say that the mindset number one is a choice to stay uneducated because I have a complete package of the how-tos and how to teach you how to do it all. Uh, and then the fastest way I change mindset, Michelle, is I help you make money as fast as you can. I do a marketplace. Everyone's staged in a marketplace. Everyone gets to buy and sell products or services. And as long as you stay and do everything we say, I'm only asking for two days of your life, 10 to six on you know, Pacific time and 10, actually 10 to three. If you only come that time, I'll show you how to make money. So what, what, what women have to wrestle with once I teach them how to make money is now they have money. Now they can't keep saying, oh, I have an issue with money. No, the next conversation, the right conversation would be now I want to make more. Now I want to learn more. 
So I think it's a choice to stay stuck. I think the mindset is uh, an excuse to some level. And yes, we were raised that way, but now you met me, you met you. It's a choice. Say, I'm not going to stay stuck with money anymore. I'm going to now learn how. What's interesting is you talk about you hold up your cell phone and you're like, you, you buy something at Starbucks, you go out to dinner, you buy clothes. Yeah. So money is a choice, as you say. Mm-hmm. What type of choices should we be making around our money? I've heard things like, for instance, how do you treat your money? Do you have a nice wallet? Do you crumble your money up? Do you look at your bank accounts and stuff like that? <laughs> I think that's all bullshit. I have money all over the place. I mean, not in an unorganized way, but no, I think that's like an interesting thing to make you conscious about money. So I shouldn't say it's bullshit, but it's like an interesting way for like the babies to begin to pay attention to keep your money, you know, straight and organized. And I worked at a bank for about four seconds. So, you know, all that's, it's, you know, interesting. It's helpful. Does it change how you make money? No. I see the most unorganized, chaotic multimillionaires because they're using this. They're turning on their creativity and saying, how do I transact money? How do I do all that? And I don't even carry a purse. I think that's like ridiculous. I don't carry that around. I don't like, no, I don't think any of that stuff matters because I've been a multimillionaire for decades. So I think that's all just interesting things that keep you busy versus keep you on task. Like the real thing you got to do is what's your product and service and who are you going to sell it to? Let's get to the front line, right? And then again, checking your bank balances is not where you need to make financial decisions. Checking your P&L, right? Your profit and loss statement is how you should be making decisions. So a lot of it is, Michelle, how we were raised. How we were raised with money is completely wrong. It's completely backwards. And, you know, again, meeting me, this conversation, now you can say, stop. I'm going to start being conscious about my decisions about money and what I'm doing. And the biggest mistake people make is thinking they're going to get debt free and rich. That does not happen. You're going to have a lot of debt, good debt. Like, why would you pay your house off, especially with mortgage rates right now? You can get like sub 2% mortgage rates. So, why would you put hundreds of thousands of dollars to a house and be debt free of a house when you could put hundreds of thousands of dollars to work and make 10, 12, 15? I mean, I have some online accounts, so I'm making 42%. My son, and I have one account with doing 78%. So when you can put 100,000 to work, make it 78%, last I checked, a year from now, that'll be $178,000. So why would you take 100 and waste it on paying off the house and cheap debt? So I think there's just a lot of really, really wrong thinking about money. And until people decide I'm gonna learn the right way, uh, they'll just spin around. Well, I think that's part of it is that we don't know a different way to to think about money. We've been raised, as you mentioned, certain ways you get a job, you pay your debt off, you know, you pay your house off, you pay your car off, all of that. One of the things that you had said in our first uh, interview was about starting an LLC. And you're, you're funny. You said like, if someone loses a job, say, thank you. That's great. (laughs) Congratulations. Because what it does, Michelle, is when you get laid off, you get urgent. So I coach a lot of people who have a job, right? So they have the convenience of the paycheck and they're working on their entrepreneurial venture. But the entrepreneurial venture never really gets the attention it deserves because you allow yourself to have, you know, be consumed into the job. So then you don't have time to get to your entrepreneurial venture. And then Without time, you don't have money because you're not actually creating any new cash. So it's just this waste of time versus I'm going to teach you how to sell fast and get out of your job. So then the entrepreneurial venture can be all of your effort. So I like it when people are laid off because it gets them urgent, makes them like got to get to it and got to get, you know, making some new money. And I I love about COVID. I love the COVID uh, situation for a lot of reasons. It created on the income side, a lot of entrepreneurs, we've made so many entrepreneurs and helped them get to six figure incomes. And on the other side, it's created a volatile market, like crazy volatile market. So for the investor, it's a gold mine out there, out here. I'm having a great time buying tons of stuff that people have no idea what to do with. Well, you talk about starting your LLC. And one of the things that I don't think people, and they're like, find out what you're good at and start making money. Yep. 
one of those things and start making money. And you've said it several different times is you have to sell. Now, selling comes easy for some people and then other people need to learn. So how do you teach people to be a good salesperson? I'm the best. (laughs) <laughs> so, so what 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 is it what well, i'll just know. i'll teach it quickly and then i'm uh, you know we weren't going to give people a marketplace to take bids so when they go get the gifts we'll follow up and we'll talk about a marketplace today. how about that okay. so our marketplace was normally 97 dollars for two people which is ridiculous it's under 50 bucks and most of our people that go to our marketplace make over 500 dollars I had people this last weekend on Friday and Saturday, the 27th and 28th of May. So whenever you're listening to uh, this podcast, the, that time period, which then was a long weekend. And I had over half that class say through the whole weekend marketplace. And we have people making thousands of dollars, right? Thousands of dollars by, by teaching you to sell properly. So first of all, let's take the word sell out of there and replace it with serve. So like I know, and I would ask all of you that are listening, right? Do you have a gift in town? And for those of you who are, you know, spiritual believers, I know God gave you something. It all ended up here. Now, whether you've organized it in a way that people can buy it from you is something I'll help you organize. But I stood in that line a long time, right? I stood in that gifts of how to teach people about money. Not only did I get the gift of how to make myself a millionaire, I got the gift of how to teach you how which is a whole advanced skill set. There's a lot of people that wrote books about how to be, how they became a millionaire, but they're not teaching you how to become a millionaire. And there's a big walk from doing it and then transferring that knowledge so somebody else can do it. And that's what I stood in that line from God and got a lot of gifts on transferring the knowledge. I made thousands and thousands of millionaires. So you all have a gift and talent. You all have something that you can, and and guess what this is, by the way, a book is your brains on paper, right? So this is my experience on paper. And I have five New York Times. I've wrote and collaborated in 52 different books. I've got tons. I got another one, McGraw-Hill, we're signed for the fourth Millionaire Maker book. So there's three of these, three series, and I've got a fourth one coming Q1, 2022. It's called How to Make Your Kids Millionaires. So on paper, my kids were millionaires by 10. So back to making money, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to teach you not only how to make it, I'm going to teach you how to keep it. I'm going to teach you the best, right? So I'm not selling you, I'm serving you. So first you got to replace that weird psychology. I'm not a salesperson. No, but you have a mouth and you can talk. And one of the things that we, we, we teach you is you're paid for great conversations. So the way I have a great conversation, right? Um, is I, and you can kind of role play with me if you want, Michelle. I would say, Michelle, my name's Laurel. I'm a money expert. What can I do for you today to help you with money? What's one thing I could do to help you with money today? You could- that, is, that is awesome. And I so appreciate that because I do think that's powerful instead of thinking of sales, thinking of service, which is incredible. But what, what you know, what's another step? I feel like I've heard that before. <laughs> Is there any other secret sauce in there? Like, do you set goals? Do you visualize? Do you, you know, what is it, Laurel? I feel like you're you're hiding, you're holding back from me a little bit. Is yeah, there something in there? So yeah, there's obviously goal setting, right? How much money do you need to make? How much do you want to make? And those are two different. Need is going to cover your bills. That's not enough to run a company. So then there's a want is I need a VA. I need a tech to help with all my web and my social media. So then you start adding it up. And I can just tell you, as a startup, you're going to need between five and thousand, five, two to 5,000 extra a month to hire the people to do whatever you want to do to get to six figures. So let's just say you live on five, where you're going to need another five. You say, well, that doesn't give me any extra to invest. I know. So let's go to 15,000 a month or 12,000 a month and invest the rest. So yeah, you need that structure of how much do I need? And by the way, those of you who have a job, replacing your income is not an entrepreneurial goal. That's a ridiculous goal. That's your household goal. That's not the business's goal. And a lot of women collapse that household goal with a real business goal. So a business, I mean, if you're going to go for it and be an entrepreneur, make six figures. It's too much work. And if you can't hire it, that means you have to do the work. You probably suck at it. So it's not going to get done very well. Meaning your accounting, meaning your social media, meaning your video editing, all of that's got to get done. And you got to have, you got to hire it. So 
that's kind of the big stuff. But I want to go back to, I mean, I want to like go back to like my scripting is very easy. When I meet somebody, right, they'll say my name, so and so, my name's Laurel. And they'll say, what do you do? I said, I'm a money expert. And notice, like, I immediately, so what's one thing I could do to help you today? And then I shut up. See, selling is also, and serving is about listening. It's not about what I have, because you know what? Uh, when I do say, well, I want to get out of debt, or I want to learn how, what my first steps of investing, I'll decide if I want to give you this or not. This may not be the first thing. Maybe what you need is this one. Right. So by me asking you, what's the one thing I can help you with today? I'm listening for what's the one thing. And then I'm going to come up with an offer based on all the things I have. Now, I know people listening will say, well, I don't have these things. Well, guess what? I didn't have these things either. I sold Kiyosaki's thing called Rich Dad Poor Dad for five years before I had things. Right before the broadcast, you said I should add some product to, you know, the, the services of coaching. Well, I'm in Newstan, right? We're both over 50, neither of us look like it. So I'm sure you have a great facial product regime. I do too. Mine's a new skin. I do Galvanic Spas. I do them on a regular basis. I take amazing stuff to make sure I don't get a lot of wrinkles. I take CBD like it's water. Um, I get all sorts of things I sell, which by the way, includes water. So I, I get checks from those things too, but that, that supplements what I'm doing. So you don't have to have a thing. You can be an affiliate. You can sell my stuff. You can sell other people's stuff. Uh, you can sell, I don't know, what else do you want to sell? Like I had a woman just send me four <laughs> IM cards. I have so much stuff in my office. My, office, my, my staff goes, why do you have all this stuff? I said, people sell me shit because they want me to sell all their stuff. So I have these little IM cards. You know, they, this is taking one out of Bob Proctor's playbook, right? Where you write down the goal in the back of the IM card. Cute, interesting, won't fit in a wallet, wrong size, but that's fun. Um, <laughs> So, well, you know, when you were talking about before, you held up the, the Millionaire Maker book, and then you held up another book, the Yes book, for those of you who are just listening um, on podcast and not watching us. So I, I love that, that you really do know how to dig in. And, you know, it does, it just comes naturally. It just sort of flows out of you. You've talked about being lucky versus intention. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, actually, uh, we are putting together a product that's actually going to be luck or intention. Because I think a lot of people think it's lucky that, it, you know, I arrived as the millionaire maker and who I became. And that was very intentional, right? Farm girl for Nebraska. It, it's great. I still go back. I'm going back over the 4th of July. That's kind of our traditional thing is we, you know, have go out to the lakes and have this big 4th of July as a little ritual. But I can tell you, that's not where I wanted to raise my family. I, I live in Lake Tahoe, Nevada. I wanted to live in the mountains. I want to ski every day. I love the snow. So I live where I want and invest where it makes a lot of sense. So the luck versus intention, luck is luck. It's like rolling the dice like a lottery ticket. I don't live my life by that. I don't live by my life by regret. I don't live my life by coincidence. Like there's no coincidence because I believe everything is divinely ordered. Right. So when you really have that faith that it's all been divinely ordered, it, you know, like I just got this cool frame for, from one of my friends. It says, you know, trust the timing of your life. Right. It has all been divinely. Now, can you manipulate it? Can you orchestrate it? Yeah. By interesting decisions. Right. By interesting decisions, you can you can uh, do a different trajectory all the time. But intention is is, is a is a really, really I mean, that is this book. Right. This the, is how the yes, live. she's holding up yes energy book. <laughs> yes, yes energy. It's how do you live by faith? How do you know? Like I was on a broadcast the other day and you know, someone said, when do you know that it's not intention? I said, when it's hard. That's just kind of the quick lesson I'll give about it. When it's really hard and it's not flowing and it's not, not that you might now struggle or like the grit, like having to really wrestle with the decision or like you know, like create it, problem solving, like that's necessary. That's part of being in business. That's part of it all. So I'm not talking about that kind of part. I'm talking about you've been at it for a year or two and it hasn't budged at all. I mean, you should have got the clue, right? If it's that hard, nothing's moving. Then you got to move away. You got to back up and you got to reapproach it from a different angle. Like, uh, you know, I'll talk about our, our Make Kids Millionaires book. It got really hard. It was really easy. It was flowing. And then it got really hard. And it was that hard and very stuck place. 
from that, that actually got us creative and said, you know what, why don't we go back to McGraw? I said, why don't I go back to my publisher and say, how would you like a fourth book in the series? It's almost already written. I have a new, you know, author, you know, co-pilot, because he was a pilot. Uh, his uh, name's Kyle, and he made his kids millionaires. So you have a very conservative way and Laurel's way, which is if you want it, spend it, buy it. We're going to make the greatest life. So somewhere in there, how do you want to make your kids millionaires? I said, it's a great story. It's a great book. It's all true. Anyway, so we went to McGraw-Hill. But if it wouldn't have been for getting kind of stopped for a little bit, we wouldn't have backed up and then reapproached how to, how to do it. So I think that the intention is, is already in front of you. You have to take the action to move. And a lot of people don't move, Michelle. I, I'm finding that most people are in COVID coma. And now they have no excuse because that's all I sat over, you know, chalk one up to another, you know, pandemic category, right? You got polio, you got all this stuff, whatever, put, put COVID in there. The chances of you and I, who are fairly healthy women dying or getting really, really sick from it. I had it a few times. I'm still here, at least of my concerns after January 3rd. Um, so I think people are going to have to wake up, get out. Right. Of the no, it's true. People are paralyzed. I absolutely agree. Frozen, paralyzed. They've kind of, you know, you, it's a lot of it is momentum, right? Like once you start going, once you're in the flow and you've got momentum, it really helps a lot to get to the next step. Yes. But you yes. keep mentioning January 3rd and you keep talking about how, you know, God has a plan and you, we have this in common. We both almost died. So yep. I wanted to ask you, what was your thought? Because I remember my thought when I went from the gurney to the ICU bed and I was like, oh my gosh, this is real. Like I'm, this might be it. And for me, I found peace. I was at peace with my life. I didn't, I wasn't married. I didn't have kids. I didn't have everything that I wanted. But for me, for whatever reason, I found peace. What, where were you at? What were you thinking when that happened? When you were like, I've got 52 minutes to live. At that point, did you know you had 52 minutes to live no. or? Okay. When no, you it all happened really fast. Um, like very similar. I'm on the gurney. I had gone from uh, an urgent care to a police escort ambulance to the trauma center in uh, downtown, you know, down you know, closer to Reno and, you know, straight into trauma surgery. And I just remember them counting down and that's the moment I looked up and, you know, she said 58 and then I remember 52 and I was gone, you know? And, uh, you know, she said, you've ruptured your spleen, you're bleeding out. And I was, my God, I mean, you've never bled out before, that's exciting. They were like infusing blood as fast as I was losing blood. Um, had to cut me wide open, go find my spleen all over my insides. It was super exciting. Um, I don't know that I really, I, I just, I, the word I've had to give it a word was probably calm. I was, I didn't panic. I wasn't in a sheer, like, what's going to happen if I don't wake up out of this? Like, none of that actually occurred. It was just kind of more like probably the way I live life. It's like, all right, we got to go through it. Let's get this over with. It was more like that. It was like, all right, well, let's go. And then, you know, they put the big mask on you and away, you know, you wake up, you know, day later and going, where, where am I? And what happened to me? And then you kind of get the reality of it. Um, then I was more concerned, but right at that, I say on the, on the wake up out of it, I was probably more like, you know, the reality of my recovery was, uh, then, then it's like, oh my gosh, who's going to run the different organizations who has to step up? How quickly can I get it all moved? So nothing has, so I, I'm not a counselor. I don't believe in any of this cancel bullshit that goes on. Um, I am not a counselor. I postpone or I move. So we started just adjusting schedules. And then thank God I have a team. I just called in the army, uh, literally, and everyone took over. We didn't cancel one thing. Um, we didn't cancel any performances, nothing. Somebody else took, you know, if I was uh, not equipped early on, which I wasn't, um, other, some, other people stood in. We just kept going. Well, I don't know about you, but I started, I, I really stopped sweating those small stuff because oh. I was like, I, I, it just, things didn't bother me anymore because I was like, yeah, I almost died. <laughs> this is like nothing, you know, and eventually the small stuff started bothering me again, but it really has helped reshape 
the way I think about life. Um, have are there any lessons that you maybe pulled from that? I'd say more reinforcements. Um, it's made my kids. So my son was with me. So I can tell you. Uh, him at 21, thinking that his mom might not make it. And he's now, I'd say, responsible for everything that I, you know, have created for getting my daughter to continue on. It was a lot. So, uh, you know, we're pretty tidied up, but I'll tell you, him coming closer and uh, especially him, because he's 21 and he's a legal adult and can take signature authority. So I would say my ability to teach legacy planning has heightened I mean, it is at an all time heightened because not only am I living it, uh, you know, through my kids and what, what it had meant. Um, it's almost like, you know, it was this interesting preparation, but I also think it was really a next level. It pushed me to the next level of teaching. Like I'm attracting amazing legacy families now where kids in their twenties and thirties are gonna receive an enormous legacy and they know they're not prepared. So I'm talking about that. So I'd say for my business, the legacy conversation is front and center because it was 52 minutes away. And I remember like, I remember my son was right here. My husband was right here. Um, and my husband was above me, kind of behind me. But I remember like I was, I had my eyes on my son, Logan, of the whole, like until I was out. And us just, you know, verbally having some of that conversation because uh, he was like, well, what if you don't wake up? And uh, I said, I will, like, I'm, I'm going to be right through this. Like anything, I'm, you know, muscle girl, I'm going to get through all this. So I think from a business standpoint, it's heightened where I need to be. And I also think that's guided because it's what I need to teach next, right? It's that place in my life. And a lot of my clients follow that along. Um, my health has always been important, but it is an all-time high. Um, and it has to be, and it has to stay there. So well, uh, I, I cannot believe how we are coming to the end, like our conversations go by so quickly, <laughs> but to sort of button this up with, you know, talking about your near death, near death experience and, you know, your son, what would you say to us midlife women? You know, what, what would be the one piece of advice that you would give us to get off our lazy assets, as you like to say, what would you like to tell us about that? Well, a couple of messages to kind of, again, kind of put together the pieces of our interview, which is, you know, as Les Brown says, you know, best, most dreams die in a graveyard. So don't let those dreams die. If you have a book in you, you have a message, you need to get it out. I mean, you got the second half of your life now to like get to it. So no more bullshit, no more excuses. Don't live with that. Oh, I have a mindset issue. Then read Yes Energy. You're going to go to, um, I actually have a great link, right? So we can put that in the, the, the notes too, but it's justmetlaurel.com. So it's J-U-S-T-M-E-T-L-O-R-A-L, spell my name, L-O-R-A-L, justmetlaurel.com forward slash, um, it's new mid, right? So um, you're going to go there and you're going to get a bunch of gifts from me and consume them, read them. And what is that thing you got to put on the planet? Don't, you know? die with your lazy assets in you. You all have a gift and a talent, something that you've lived your life, especially later in life. You have so much experience and wisdom. Do not take it to the grave, right? Which then goes probably to the next part of, you know, our dear, our near death experiences. You know, you don't know when it's going to come, right? So, I mean, again, live fully. Don't live with any regrets, whatever you need to do. Like my husband and I and my daughter, um, well, I never really did it much with my son. It was my daughter's thing to always have a bucket list. And so like, she's got eight things we're going to do this summer on the bucket list. And it's going to be a summer bucket list. And we are going to do all these things and we're going to. So, you know, don't live with regret and, and don't take all of your dreams and this amazing gift and talent you have to your graveyard. you got to get out and you got to monetize it. And, you know, I promise a three to five year millionaire plan. I don't care if you're listening to this in your 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. It's never too late. Never too late. Well, and I, I do want to ask one more question before we, we sign off. When you talk about get off your lazy assets, do you have a specific thing that you're talking about? Or are you just talking about like, don't waste your talents? Well, it's the easy stuff is don't waste your talents. What it's really about is your assets. Is like I have clients that have all sorts of real estate not performing a horrible stock portfolio sitting in mutual funds. So I'm talking about lazy assets, like true lazy assets. I have a woman 
Um, I'll just kind of use general numbers, but she has, she's north of 3 million, right? Some of us from a, a, a divorce from a, a very high profile surgeon. A lot of it's hers on her own, but together she's over 3 million. And I said, just think about it. Like for every million, even if you only invested at 12%, which is like a sleep, um, that's, that's 120,000 per million in, in payments to her at, divide by 10, 12, that's 10,000 a month. So for 3 million, I said, as I look at your P&Ls and balance sheet, for 3 million in assets, you should have 30,000 in cash flow a month. I said, you're at 4,000, like that's lazy assets. That's horribly invested assets. So that's why, you know, she hired our community of amazing people to reorganize her assets. It's horribly invested. Welcome to typical financial planners. <laughs> So that's what I mean really by lazy assets. There's so many people who are so busy. And here's how it happens, Michelle, is they're so busy in their business and doing with their busyness, then they wake up one day and go, oh, I thought my financial planner had my back. Uh, no, I call and park your money with the financial planner and be broke. Like, I, now there's some really good ones out there. So I do have to say that, but the majority, they don't even have a million. How the hell are they gonna manage your million? So wait, get off your lazy assets, just wake up because a lot of you are done and you don't even know you're done. Meaning you have your freedom day if you have better investments. And a lot of people don't realize that. Paul, I think, I think a lot of us in midlife are starting to wake up. We're waking up to our health. You know, we're waking up to our relationships. And most importantly, we need to wake up to our money, yeah, you know? Absolutely. And so Laurel, I just love talking to you. And so- we will have all the links uh, in the, the show notes. Um, is there anything else you wanted to talk to, to plug or how we can contact you? So if you go to, again, justmetlaurel.com forward slash new mid, you've got a bunch of my gifts. And uh, from there, uh, I'll, our team, I have a very high touch team, uh, either Kristen, Molly or Lavelle will call you. They're going to welcome you, say hello and then talk to you about our marketplace. Our marketplace is usually the place a lot of people start. It's a $97 for two people commitment, super simple, easy, bring some friends, learn to make money. Like all of you, it's the best gift I could ever give you is teaching you how to make money like this, like quick. Because once you've got that handled, like the rest gets easy. But it is that making money, Michelle, because we're so ingrained on money comes from a job, right? And so you're looking around for a job to create that cash flow versus yourself. When you flip that switch, <coughs> your life changes. It's brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Laurel. This was awesome as always. And I just really appreciate you. And I love how you are <laughs> empowering us women to get off our lazy assets, to yep. get control of our finances and let's, let's make more millionaires. Absolutely. We need a lot of them. The women, you tend to stay like below the radar around the hundreds of thousands. Like, Come on, there's only 3% of women who grow million dollar companies. So be that woman. Let me help you. Why not, right? Let's do it. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Laurel.